Support for the Capital Connection comes from United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, UUPinfo.org. And New York State United Teachers, representing professionals in education and healthcare, online at nysut.org. It's the Capital Connection. Hi, I'm Alan Chartok. Joining me this week is Jay Jacobs, chair of the New York State Democratic Committee. Welcome, Jay. Well, thanks for having me, Alan. Governor Kathy Hochul is now the first elected woman governor of New York. You were an early endorser of Kathy Hochul. The election, however, was closer than you would think in blue state New York, comma, no. <laughs> well, yes, it was, was closer than we would have liked it to be. Uh, you know, it is blue state New York. But, um, you know, it was a tough fought campaign. It was the most competitive gubernatorial campaign in years, uh, with more money being pumped in on the Republican side than we've ever seen. A lot of independent expenditure group spending, particularly the Ron Lauder money. So we had a lot of work to do. Yeah, there was a very interesting article about Ron Lauder, as you say, in the um, Times this weekend. Can money really buy elections? Yes, it can. And I think that's It's not even up for dispute because we know that voters respond to those negative ads, the TV ads, social media, digital uh, uh, ads, and uh, and they respond to mail in their mailboxes. And so all of these things together do make an impact. So, Jay Jacobs, if somebody gives you a bunch of money and says, here, go win for the Democrats, how would you use your money? Well, I'd say that 60 percent should be persuasion, you know, getting messages out on TV and the like, mail, digital. And then near 40 percent should be field, uh, uh, canvas operations, getting out in the field, making sure that you're knocking on doors, phoning uh, likely voters and making sure you get your vote out. Interesting. And you think it works? I think it does. I I think it does. Um, You know, sometimes you have to, you know, when you when you're confronted with uh, an attack like we had with uh, Ron Lauder's um, money in the IEs, we had to put much more money on TV and persuasion than we would have liked. Uh, that did force a change in strategy, I think. But, you know, we, we certainly had a very robust ground game. And, um, you know, I, I think that, that that at the end of the day, with the help of the unions in particular, that's who I want to really thank. The unions, I think, were did a fabulous job getting out in the street and coordinating with the state party with our coordinated campaign. We spent, uh, before the end of the campaign, we had spent $4.5 million across the state with uh, about 50 different field offices and field staff, over 750 volunteers operating all the time, phone calls, door knocking, uh, texting, and the like. And so I think with what the unions added, that's why you saw some of the uh, – turnout numbers that we saw in heavily Democratic uh, districts, uh, particularly in the city of New York and uh, even some, uh, you know, uh, outside throughout upstate. We're talking to Jay Jacobs, chair of the New York State Democratic Committee. Now, the New York Times reports that if the Democrats lose the House, the blame might be laid on New York, which lost four House seats to Republicans. That's so. Well, the facts are the facts. I mean, if we hadn't lost four seats, the Democrats would have four more seats. And if that's the difference, then, yes, you can blame New York or any other place that might have four seats. But, uh, you know, it's a disappointment. It's something that, um, you know, we take seriously and uh, and don't make make light of. I, I just I just feel that, uh, you know, we did the best that we could uh, with what we were operating with. I, I don't think that you're going to hear from any of the candidates that lost. Uh, disappointment with the state party. I don't think you're going to hear any uh, of those candidates speak uh, uh, negatively about you know what all of us tried to do in the coordinated campaign. I think quite the contrary. And and a lot of the winning candidates like Pat Ryan in some of the tough races, 
you know, people have to talk to Pat Ryan and see if he feels that uh, the state party was of any help. And I think you know, he'll tell you that uh, we made a big difference. So, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I see that there is some of the usual sniping from some folks after an election because they're unhappy with the, the results. And that's something I've just gotten used to because it happens in every election. And frankly, it happens with both parties. We're talking to Jay Jacobs, chair of the Democratic Party. Jay, in the same time story we've been talking about, you're quoted regarding an internal party squabble with Senator Gianaris over the redistricting debacle. Can you explain what that's all about? Yeah, I mean, uh, look, I don't believe in spending a lot of time pointing fingers. Unfortunately, after the last election, when the ballot uh, referenda went down, um, you know, from his uh, from his uh, uh, organization and even uh, in what he said, he, he, he chose to blame the state party as if we failed. And, and frankly, that's taken, you know, that's taken hold. If you look at social media and look uh, elsewhere, people believe that. People believe that I, I dropped the ball on that. It's completely untrue. It was, it was a complete fiction, um, and I'm just calling him out on it. And, and look, if you want to make the claim uh, that the redistricting mess was somehow my fault, which is what is being said, I, th- I think that's the most twisted and contorted argument I've ever heard. Because e- even if you want to take it, and let's, let's believe them, and, and let's say that it's because of failure of the ballot referenda and what that would have done to help whatever it was that they wanted to do on redistricting, and, and I, I dispute that, but let, let's say you, you buy that argument. Okay, so then how come that Carl Hasty and the Assembly didn't have such a catastrophic uh, problem with their uh, reapportionment, as did the state Senate and the Congressionals, which was run out of the state Senate. Why? Well, I, I think the Carl Hasty operated in a collaborative way. He tried to work with Republicans. He proposed steps. He did the things that people would expect to be done. He did it right. And uh, at least in this election cycle, uh, that redistricting, redistricting was allowed to stand. Now, he's got to redo it for the next time, but uh, a little bit. But um, only on process. But I just, I just will tell you, he did it the right way, and and um, uh, and I just, I just think that okay, you know, I, I think that everybody was well intentioned for the Democrats. Don't get me wrong, I think they did what they and what they tried to do was all well intentioned to strengthen our district. So I, I give them credit for that. It just didn't work. But when it doesn't work, don't turn around and point the finger at somebody else. That might me Not and expect you. me to sit quietly. You know, <laughs> I got it. Let's talk about bail reform. This is a big issue for Republicans during the campaign. Do Democrats need to reach across the aisle more on this particular bail reform issue? Yeah, well, I, I think it's not about reaching across the aisle. Let, let's face it. OK, fact number one, uh, and this is borne out by the statistics. And if you speak with you know honest brokers in this, not people who you know have, a, have an agenda, you will see that the increase in crime, which is a nationwide trend, has nothing to do with bail reform. That's not to say that there aren't examples that you could point out here and there, which you could do with any law in any state at any time. But there are examples here and there where bail reform uh, could be viewed as a, as a reason why someone might have gotten out too early and then they committed another crime. And I understand that. But that doesn't paint the picture of the entire program, which was a good good bill and the right thing to do. And it's been done in 19 states. And there are states across the country that have worse increases in crime and no bail reform. And by the way, those states are red states. So look, we have a crime problem. That's true. Kathy Hochul had specific measures, took specific action to rein it in. We're beginning to see the effects of that. Unfortunately, people in the streets don't see it. And when you have the New York Post every single day putting on its cover, you know, another full page picture and headline about another crime that's taken place and blaming it on Kathy Hochul or bail reform, that's going to have an impact on what people believe. And the Republicans take advantage of that. They have never. Republicans remember this. They have never in in our recent history been constrained by the truth. That's never been a problem for them. Okay. (laughs) You know, Jay Jacobs, do you, as the chair of the Democratic Committee, deal with the leaders in the Assembly and the Senate, you know, on a day-to-day basis? Do do, do you touch base? Well, I wouldn't say it's day-to-day, certainly not when they're in session. Um, You know, it's not for me to be calling 
over to leadership and, and telling them what I think they should do. We just don't do it that way. Well, why uh, not? But, why not? The point, Jay, is that if you don't do that and they make mistakes, you know, the party, the well, Democratic Party, is going to pay at the polls. Well, I, let, let me let me clarify. I do speak with them and give them my view on major pieces of legislation. I speak to senators uh, that, that call me. Uh, and they do call me, uh, by the way, and I speak to some members of the assembly who call. But I do, I do speak uh, uh, to Carl and occasionally, uh, you know, certainly to uh, Andrea uh, about things that I'm concerned about. But I don't want you to get the impression, and it's just because it isn't so, that I'm calling on a day day to day basis. It's not like that. Um, I did voice my concerns about bail reform early on. You'll remember, mm-hmm. and and those concerns were more about the process of how the bill was being passed. Uh, because, number one, I think we didn't do uh, a good enough job in terms of meeting with constituency groups like the, the uh, police organizations and the district attorneys to really spend the time and, and vet all of these changes and, and craft them in a way that would have been less divisive. We also didn't spend enough time educating the people throughout the state as to why this was necessary, good and beneficial and in the long run will bring crime down not create more crime. If we had done that, the Republicans would have had less traction. That's my argument. But I did I did voice that. But again, I respect what they do. Their intentions are really great. And remember something. Democrats always get hit for doing things to try to make the world better. There's an adage in politics. If you do nothing, you don't get into trouble. And Republicans live by that. But then they take a look at what we're doing. They weaponize whatever it is that we do to their advantage in the next campaign and paint the worst picture of it possible to help elect their candidates. This year, in some districts, they were successful. So, Jay Jacobs, how did your Democratic Party come out after these elections? Did you maintain your supermajority? What can you report to us? Well, I don't think we're going to maintain the supermajority, which is over two-thirds in the Senate, but we'll be close. I think the Senate did a great job. I think, you know, you have to compliment the leadership there in the Senate for the support they gave to candidates in tough districts, and they did. I thought that the redistricting, of course, complicated matters and made some districts, like we had districts out on Long Island here in Nassau County that became much tougher. John Brooks, great senator, knowledgeable. If anybody deserved to get reelected, it was him. Unfortunately, because of redistricting, he's put in a district really hard to win, and he lost 60-40. But in the Assembly, I think we only lost a couple of seats. Carl Hastie ran a great operation, and the DAC, Democratic Assembly Campaign Committee, really supported its candidates. And I have to tell you, if there's a hero in this entire election across the state, it's Carl Hastie. Carl Hastie from the beginning. Now, let's just was, uh, let's just tell the people that that's the speaker. <laughs> I'm sorry. Of, that's, right. that's all right. Some people might assembly. not know. He, yeah. he and I were on the phone. If I'm telling you six to eight times a day, every day. Really? He, he was energizing unions. He himself was standing in his own district encouraging people at poll sites during early voting to vote. He was giving us advice on messaging that he thought was critical. This is a guy who spent every single day during the election active and communicating with the state party, with me personally, and the governor's campaign to try to ensure that we had a victory. So there's credit to the guy, and I haven't seen it in any newspaper. And this is why, or any article, you know, so much of what you read is a distortion of what actually and truly happened. Carl Hastie's a hero here. I want to go back to you on that because I certainly agree with you that the newspapers aren't doing everything that they could be doing in terms of reporting the internal workings of the legislature and the political parties. It's tough to criticize those folks because, you know, they don't like it when you do it. Yeah, you know, neither do I, but I guess that's tough if you're in this business, you know? If you're going to be— I agree. It's a tough business, and you got to take it. Look, I woke up this morning to somebody— who who sent through one of my accounts uh, almost a direct email to me telling me that I was a disgrace and and, I should move Mm. to Florida and be with the other Republicans. I read numbers of these things. Of course, where does this person get that from? Gets that from, you know, the nonsense that's on social media and other places. You know, we have a a, a prominent member of Congress um, who, who came out immediately asking for my resignation, who absolutely has no idea of what it is the state party did, what I did, what I put in personally financially, personally to these campaigns and what I raised and what we spent and where we spent it. And yet they make their judgments that we fell short. Well, I didn't see her anywhere on the campaign trail till the last day. And, you know, look, she's sitting with millions in her bank account. Where was the help? So, you know, people are really quick to criticize others. And I wouldn't do it other than hitting back. My view is, you know, rather than than do this stuff and with 
half-baked information if, and sometimes no information at all. L- let's figure out how, how we do it better, what, what the real problems were that created difficulty and challenges for our party. We're talking to Jay Jacobs, chair of the New York State Democratic Committee. Okay, so Jay, what about the Supreme Court's recent decisions on abortion? Do you think that had an impact on races in New York? Yes, I do. I don't think it had as big an impact as it did in other states. You know, people need to remember one of the reasons that we won in some of these other states, they're always comparing, you know, how come New York did so badly compared to other states? Well, California had a rough go as well. One of the commonalities between California and New York is is we're two states that are completely controlled legislatively and in the executive by the Democrats, and we're two of the most progressive states. So let's take that as a common thread. But then you take a look at the issue of abortion. So many people here in New York said, yeah, we, we we're very upset about abortion and we don't like Zeldin's view on abortion. But, you know, it's a, it's a Democratic state. It's never going to change. And it's not under threat here. So the impact of Roe, uh, Roe v. Wade being uh, the Dobbs decision being overturned, uh, it was not as strong as it was across the country in some of the other states where you actually could lose your rights, uh, your reproductive rights. So let's remember there was a difference there, but it did have some impact here. I won't say none, just not as strong an impact. The other thing I will tell you, sure. if you look at the other states, where Democrats won in other states, overwhelmingly in those competitive seats, the largest numbers were against Republican wackadoos, Republican crazies, election deniers, and the public just decided yeah. to vote against crazy. We didn't have that much of that here. You know, you had, you did have uh, Lawler, who was successful, by the way, um, you know, against Maloney, and you did have Santos against Zimmerman. But across the board here, uh, yes, yes, Zeldin, um, uh, and by the way, those are two Republican wins. But um, Zeldin, uh, who, who lost, was a, an election denier and, and tried to get away with it here, and, and, and he wasn't successful. But uh, overall, you know, you look across the country, the, the Democrats were really fighting much harder against direct Trump crazies. And that was, uh, I think that was an easier lift because I wish we had a few more of those here in New York and we might have had a better chance of it. Now, you did mention that Hudson Valley seat and, and Lawler and all. What did you make of that? Well, it's like everything else. You know, if you took a look at the ads, they were banging away on, on uh, Sean Patrick Maloney on crime. They made him out to seem like, uh, you know, he, he was the, the captain of bail reform. Again, bail reform is not the real problem. But it's, you know, it's what the Republicans have weaponized to use against people like him. It's a tougher district. It's only 25 percent of his original district. You know, remember, we had redistricting mm-hmm. here and he got a tougher district and he got a district that most people didn't know him. And he had to introduce himself to that at the same time. He had the burden of being the chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, mm-hmm. responsible for everybody else. So he's raising money and spending money and helping other Democratic congressional candidates across the country. And, of course, Lawler had 100 percent of his time to spend campaigning negatively and falsely against uh, against Sean. And, and so, you know, he paid the price. And I, I think that, you know, we owe him a debt of gratitude for all the work that he did. It was selfless and it cost him. It cost him, and hopefully, uh, you know, we'll get him back at some point. So, Sean Patrick Maloney, could he have politically behaved in a different way with a better outcome? I don't know about that. You know, remember something. What we inside look at, see, and judge is really very different outside our bubble, because outside our bubble, you've got average uh, citizens, average voters, who very simply, uh, you know, want to know, what we're doing to improve their lives. What are we doing about education? How are we making sure costs aren't skyrocketing? We had a situation here nationwide where we're confronted with 8% inflation. You know, gas prices, of course, peaked and then have come down, but that aggravated voters. You take that, you throw in the crime component, and it's it's really very hard for every uh, incumbent. But I I don't think that I want to say that uh, Sean could have done anything differently. I, I think it was just a real tough environment in a tough district during a tough time. How much does personality control what happens in an election? In other words, if Sean Patrick Maloney was a different guy with a different attitude, if he wasn't, wasn't as confrontational, that kind of thing, would the outcome have been different? Well, you know, I don't know. Personality is people have to like the people they vote for. That's always, you know, there's the old say, who, who would you want to go out and have a, have a beer with, right? Right. We always, we always hear that. Um, I, I remember... Uh, uh, then Senator Obama in the debate against uh, Hillary saying, well, she's likable enough, you know, uh, and, and those kinds of things. And by the way, Hillary's very likable. 
But uh, I would say to you that uh, I think it's a factor. I don't think it's the factor. Bottom line is what voters want is they want somebody who's going to be looking out for their interests. And the Republicans this year did a very good job of trying to scare voters, which is what they normally do, or make them angry. And, and that's how they were successful. By the way, whenever they're successful, you take a look back. That's how they do it. They either scare voters or they make them angry. Do you give workshops, I mean, to the people who are running for political office as Democrats? Do you say, now, here's what to do and here's what not to do? Not enough. I, I would say we do, and, and we have that, and we do have candidate training. We do train on the van, which we manage, the voter file. That's one of the, the key jobs. People don't have a, they have a misunderstanding of what the state party actually is. We're a housekeeping, organizing, coordinating entity. Mm-hmm. We're not the lead campaign entity for any of these campaigns. The Democratic Congressional Campaign runs uh, the Congressionals. The Democratic Senate Campaign Committee out of Albany runs the the Senate Senate. campaigns, and DAC, Democratic Assembly, runs those campaigns. They raise a lot of money, okay, which which we do not, and they go to those campaigns. We are basically handling the voter file, the logistical back infrastructure of making sure that the party apparatus has the means to get things done. So this year we handled the coordinated campaign. Uh, We spent, before the end of the campaign, we spent over four and a half million dollars on field operations across the state and uh, door knocking, as I've mentioned, and phone calls, texts, and the rest. Uh, We helped the uh, various campaigns get their jobs done, congressionals and the the, the state senate campaigns uh, that that asked for our help. We, We did get money and raise money for some campaigns that specifically asked for our help. But we're not flush with cash the way these campaign entities are. And it's not, you know, we don't direct their campaigns the way those entities do. I can call a campaign, even the governor's campaign. I can call them and give them my advice as to what I think they should be doing or what messaging I think they should be uh, focused on. But that doesn't mean they have to follow it. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. But that's why at the end of the campaign, you know, I think the best and most useful part of the state party for some people (laughs) it does give them somebody good to blame but but i'll tell you the truth of it is that um you know while we can always find uh, things we can do better and do more i I, nobody's perfect i I think overall uh you know the state party and all of the people associated with it all of the, the staff of the state party the county chairs 62 democratic county chairs across the state we all came together very well coordinated very well with the congressional campaigns and uh, a governor's campaign, of course, top of the ticket, to make sure we were getting out vote. And, and uh, that's what we have to do. It was a tough year here in New York. We're talking to Jay Jacobs, chair of the New York State Democratic Committee. Uh, now I want to ask you about Andrew Cuomo. I had a call from his people saying he'd like to come on the air, and that's a little bit unusual for him. Is he looking to make a return to power? Well, I mean, I, you know, I haven't spoken to him in a very, very long time, uh, but it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, but, you know, uh, look, I think this is a time, and and, and certainly, uh, you know, he should come on uh, if he wants to do that. Um, I think all of us right now have to focus our attention on making sure that the Democratic brand in the state of New York aligns with the voters of the state of New York. Uh, we have a, a very diverse Democratic Party with views across the spectrum that need to be respected, the progressive wing the uh, you know uh, that needs to be respected and listened to, as does the more uh, moderate wing of uh, our along party. Those, along those yeah. lines, are you getting along with the Working Families Party? Yes, I, I get along with them. I, I, I speak to Sochi from time to time. You know, I think they, they were very helpful, and I, I appreciate the help that they, they put in, uh, you know, uh, and, and I, I look forward to sitting down with her. Uh, I, I don't have a problem, you know, with different groups. It's, it's the issues and sometimes the language and the messaging that I think uh, turns off some moderate voters. And I think that's what's rich about some of the complaints that, you know, we're, we're sitting out here on Long Island still hearing that all of our Democratic candidates, you know, favor defund the police and our socialists. And that's none of them have said it yet. That kind of messaging out of much more uh, progressive districts and progressive um, representatives yeah. uh, still still attaches to us and hurts us. That's why you have lots of people in the middle unaffiliated voting against the Democrats because they've been sold by Republicans on the fact we favor defund the police when we are in fact funding the police <laughs> more than the Republicans. And 
uh, they, they believe that we're socialists. That's why. Why do you think, you know, I get this so often, the Asian community, uh, you know, why are, why are they going to the Republicans? Why are some Hispanic uh, groups now moving toward the Republicans? And, you know, I, I get uh, complaints that we haven't done enough to put uh, people in elected office in these, uh, in these constituency groups. And, that, and that's true. We, we're trying to do that. And I, I agree. We, we need to do that more. But that's not. That is absolutely not why the average uh, Asian American who once favored the Democrats now is going the other way or Hispanics going the other way. It's because in the Hispanic community and Asian community, uh, they don't like the totalitarian socialist regimes that they're familiar with from countries that they have come here uh, uh, trying to escape from. And any, any, uh, any hint that the Democrats favor that kind of uh, – uh, socialism uh, uh, turns them off. And then, of course, uh, in many respects, there is a conservatism on social issues where we're far more uh, um, vocal about progressive social issues. And that turns people off. Now, how do I know this? It's not just by polling. I'm actually talking to voters. You know, I'm reading articles, talking to real voters. And that's what I'm hearing. So, you know, I think we should stop getting bogged down in what the state party did and who's a vice chair and who is it. It's, it let's message correctly to people, let them understand who we are, what we're about, and how we're going to help them in their everyday lives where they need the help. How do we keep the Asian community safe from the violence that they've had to deal with? And, and, and what are we doing for that? You know, whether there's a vice chair, you know, I, 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 we should have it, but I just don't think that's going to turn a vote. Jake Jacobs, we love having you on the show. You always speak your mind, and that's what we're looking for. Jake Jacobs is chair of the New York State Democratic Committee. You can find out more at New York Dems, that's one word, nydems.org. Jay, again, we'll see you soon, and thanks so much for being with us. Well, thank you for having me, Alan. Thank you. Capital Connection is a production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. For copies, call 1-800-323-9262 or visit us online anytime at WAMC.org or just schedule a podcast anywhere you get your podcast. And join us again next week at the same time for another political conversation. Thanks for listening.